You can sit up if it's better. Bring the chair closer. By the by, we learn some shlokas also. Some that are chanted here regularly. Om Shruti Shruti Purana Nana Two things. It is sounding like a funeral. <laughs> and then secondly, there is no tea break between Smriti and Purana. Right. Om Shruti Smriti Purana Nam. Om Shruti Smriti Purana Nam. Layam Karuna Layam. Alayam Karuna Layam. Mi Bhagavat Padam. Namami Bhagavat Padam. Padam. Shankaram Loka Shankaram. Shankaram Loka Shankaram. Uh, everybody mute yourselves and repeat, okay? Yeah, because here there is a little bit of a lag. Yeah, kind of like jet lag. Yeah. <laughs> Shankaram Shankaracharyam Shankaram Shankaracharyam Keshavam Badarayanam Keshavam Badarayanam Sutra Bhashya Kritao Vande Sutra Bhashya Kritao Vande Bhagavantau Punaf Punaha Bhagavantau Punaf Punaha Ishvaro Guru Ratmeti Ishvaro Guru Ratmeti Murti Bheda Vibhagine Murti Bheda Vibhagine Yoma Vat Vyapta Dehaya Yoma Vat Vyapta Dehaya Dakshina Murta Yenamaha Dakshina Murta Yenamaha Om Sahana Vavatu Ravaram 
Welcome to the another resounding welcome to the yoga retreat. And I am sure from whatever I have heard from people, everybody is having a wonderful time. May that long continue. And I'm very happy because yoga is something which is a an important sadhana. We cannot minimize it. And it is extremely essential for many things beyond the body. We all know how it helps the body. We know that. And they are still keeping on doing research on how it helps the other areas of life in general. And one thing we know is that yoga increases self-love. And self-loath is, is our capital. Nobody likes themselves. This is our capital. Of course, this is not discussed in groups. Nobody comes to a party and says, Hello, how many people in this party that don't like themselves? I also don't like myself. This is not some kind of a thing. There... We cover it up. We cover it up. Just like, the, you know, there is a, what is that? We cover it up with various other things, such as accomplishments, degrees. If you don't have a lot of degrees, at least you will have a pedigree. So, that you will talk about. <laughs> so many ways. We cover up the self-critic, we cover up the self-loath, we cover up the self-judgment, which is the basis of a critique of others and judgment of others. That is what it is. So, so therefore, what the practice of yoga in all its uh, the eightfold, whatever the ashtangas, the eightfold, what is that called? Limbs for lack of a better translation, helps uh, increase self-love. How, one may ask, just by the sheer ability to bring body parts together that were never supposed to be together, <laughs> that itself is enough. There is a sense of accomplishment and then who knows what other, because we say that there are 72, uh, 720,000 yeah. nadis. Nadis you won't get if you do autopsy. Okay, These are all meridians. Invisible meridians meaning we can call them energy channels. So the energy channels, there are 720,000. And yoga and so many of the blocks in those meridians can exacerbate complaints, discontent with the self, with the world, with God and with everything. And so there is certain subtle ways in which those are released. There is an uh, absence of complaints after yoga and a presence of well-being. Even if one comes out of the class limping, one is happy. <laughs> so, this is, you know, this is uh, why yoga is a very, very important sadhana. And in this retreat, we are going to have four lectures, four lectures, four lectures on also another component of yoga, 
which is called yoga, but which has which has to do with uh, virtual asanas, not real asanas. Real asanas you do over there, mm -hmm. and then virtual asanas you do the rest of the time. That is the idea. What are the virtual asanas? The the uh, one uh, what is that? T-shirt uh, logo. Mm -hmm. Yeah. It was a yoga uh, camp, yoga camp t-shirt. And the person who was leading it must have had a sense of humor. It said on the front, all's well, dot, dot, dot. And then in the back it said, that bends well. <laughs> a play, uh, a, a, a word play on Shakespeare's play. What was its name? Hello, show one sign of life. I'm happy. Yeah. Yes, thank you very much. Yeah. All's well that ends well. And that somebody had put a B there. All's well that bends well. They might have meant it as a joke, but actually it's quite deep, profound. And so in life, there are many bendings that one has to do. Either one can do it gradually, gracefully, gently, or one cannot do it at all. And then what? All that does not bend, what happens to that doesn't it have breaks. As we see the trees in a storm. The trees in the storm that survive are the ones that bend to the direction of the wind. And so too, it's, it's just like that, you know, there is the teachers come in many forms. The river is our teacher, the sun is our teacher, the sky is our teacher, trees and plants are our teachers. And then when we see the trees bending in the Hurricane. Actually, there is no such word as hurricane. I want to change the spelling. Hurry came. Okay. <laughs> so this is this is exactly where this talk, these talks are going to be happening. And so here the we are going to learn, we are going to look at and unfold. The, the ways in which we can do virtual yoga, yoga of the mind, yoga of the emotions, yoga of the personality. These are what we are going to be looking at. Then, if this much is understood, then, when we look at the world in general, there are always, almost always, two perceptions. One is the world as it is. <laughs> world as it is means what? As it is. Meaning, if I say, Look at this wonderful orange. Very juicy. Who wants? <laughs> Who wants juicy orange? You look at each other. Up till now she was okay. <laughs> First you will give me the benefit of doubt. You look at did she say orange? Yeah, yeah orange. Up till now she was okay. Now something has happened. <laughs> That's the only conclusion. Why? Because here there is a collective perception, is there not? A collective perception. We are all here looking at this. And then if I am seeing orange and you are not, then we have a problem. Right? No matter how much bhakti you may have, 
towards the teaching, how much shraddha you may personally have towards me, you cannot sit, the, the heart will not sit right by saying, look at this wonderful, absolutely juicy, perfectly round orange. And so that means there is a problem of perception. If I see orange where orange is not, then what am I seeing? I am. I am not seeing the world as it is. Correct? So there are two ways of looking at the world. It is there, therefore I see it. This is objectivity. And then I see it, therefore it must be there. I see orange. I'm going to squeeze it and make for you some orange juice. <laughs> I see it, therefore it must be there. This is a subjective perception. Two perceptions ride on tandem with each other all the time in ways that we do not even know it. One is an objective perception. If there is orange, I see orange. If there is an apple, I see apple. If there is a pair of glasses, I see a pair of glasses. This is called objectivity. If I see anything other than a pair of glasses here, then that means what? It is my own subjective perception. Now we can have a little... Sanskrit Abhyasa, objective perception in Sanskritam is called Yathartha Jnanam, knowledge of things as it is. Artham Anatikramya, Yathartha Jnanam, Jnanam, knowledge, Yathartha, exactly how it is. And then the subjective perception can be called Anyatha Jnanam or Ayatartha Jnanam. Anyatha Jnanam means other than what it actually is. Ayatartha, not Yatartha. We may pride ourselves saying, I have never in my life mistaken a pair of glasses for orange. Thank God. And I consider myself a yathartha jnani. I'm an objective person. I look at the world objectively. I don't see things where they are not. And I don't mistake one thing for another. Thank God for the brain cells that are continuing to work. Thank God for the buddhi. Thank God for the vidya. We can, we can be happy. We can be complacent. Are you sure? This is my question. Are we sure that we are seeing the world objectively? Are we sure we are not making individual and collective mistakes? Oh, there is what, what is one example of a collective mistake? What a beautiful sunset. Sunrise example I don't give because I don't want people to feel bad. Many people haven't even seen a sunrise. <laughs> So, so, therefore, sunset we are on safe ground. Okay. So, if you come with me for a walk at 4.30, you can go this way, that way. At some point, the sun is going to go this way, behind in the mountains. And you can see it turn a bright yellow 
a deep orange and you can see the clouds around it. It's like the mother goddess took her palette and painted everything. Beautiful. Orange, red, yellow, purple, streaks of white if there are clouds. And then the sun sets. And then we have a lovely aha moment. Mm -hmm. What a beautiful sunset by the Ganga. How nice. Is the sun really setting? Hmm? If we have taken even fourth standard geography classes, <laughs> the sun is not setting. Neither is it rising for that matter. It's not setting. Yet every evening, we make a collective mistake, ayatartha, and we call it sunset and we revel in it. And if some, somebody was there next to you saying, well, actually the sun is not setting, it is the action of the earth rotate, rotating around itself and revolving around the sun, you will tell that person, shut up. <laughs> Kill joy. That's what you are. <laughs> yeah. You're a total killjoy. What's wrong with you? Shut up. If you don't, you can just go somewhere else. I'm enjoying this. In a way, this is a collective quote-unquote mistake. But it's not really a mistake. Because everybody in, the, in our hearts, we know that the sun is neither setting nor is it rising. But we are able to enjoy the sunset. And so it is a mistake. And the word for mistake in Sanskrit is adhyasa. Adhi asa. Adhyasa. Adhi in front of or on top of as a projection. So projection on the sun leads to the perception of a sunset. It's an adhyasa. Mistake. Collective mistake. Just like I will get a glass of water and put a pen inside that water. What do you see? What happened to the pen? Bent. Bent pen. We all see it. We all say, oh, the pen is bent. Take it out. <laughs> Straight pen, not a bent pen. Put it back in, bent pen. <laughs> it is a perception. And it is a mistake also, but it is a mistake which has the backing of knowledge. We know the pencil or the pen is not bent. We also know that the sun has not set in in the behind the mountains. Neither has the sunset nor has the moon risen. We know that. Yet we can enjoy all this because there is jnanam behind it. These are called these kinds of mistakes which are not really mistakes are called jnana adhyasa. Jnana plus adhyasa jnana adhyasa. A mistake which is backed by my knowledge, but yet I can enjoy the perception without coming to any harm. Then there are certain other mistakes which cause harm. And the best stock example in Vedanta is that of Rope snake. You go out of your house at twilight. Let's say you have a garden in front. And you see something with three bends. <laughs> what do you say? Snake. No, no, before that you say eek, then you say snake. First you scream, you jump, then you say snake. But you have invested in a mobile phone. 
my mobile phone suddenly you would call a friend you would phone a friend no <laughs> no no ah not you would take a picture <laughs> you have a flashlight behind that mobile <laughs> you quickly turn that on and shine the light on this blessed thing lying on the ground <laughs> It's a hose pipe you forgot to put away after watering the lawn. It looked exactly like a small cobra. That's one. Why? Because twilight, indistinct light. And so there is a mistake made. And what is the mistake? This is a snake. This is the mistake. It's a subjective perception. Adhyasa, all right. Artha dhyasa. Artha means the meaning, the conclusion is wrong. What I saw is not wrong. It is similar to a snake. It does have three bends, it has the same size, but it is not a snake. It ain't a snake. What I saw may be right. But the conclusion that I drew from what I saw is wrong. That's why we have to shine the light. When you shine the light, you say, Aha! Aha! Rope! Aha! Hose pipe! That's why mistaking the snake, mistaking the rope for the snake is called aropa. <laughs> aropa, mistake. Aropa actually means projection. You project, you project the snake. Where is the snake? All that there is is a horse pipe. Where is the snake? If then I use my flashlight to look for the snake, did it go and hide in the bushes? No. Where is the snake? Ah. It was in the form of a projection, which is as easily as it was projected, withdrawn in the light of knowledge. When I see the rope as a rope, or a horse pipe as a horse pipe, then it is Yathartha Jnana. It is Yathartha Jnana. And so therefore, I don't, next time when I pass by the rope, I don't scream. Why? The knowledge has taken place. This is exactly what, this is exactly is what is called virtual yoga. Where the ahamkara has to bend in the light of knowledge that we are confronted with every day. The ahamkara, the I notion, has to sometimes do a headstand in order to lose its subjectivity. All the notions that I have about myself, which are wrong, about the universe, about Ishvara, God. Yeah, can you please mute yourself, whoever is talking in the background. You can continue to talk, but I don't want to listen to it, that's all. So, maybe there is a way I can mute everybody. I used to know how to do that, but... <laughs> Participants, yeah. Participants, mute all. Yes. Wonderful. Then, then we have, we have, when we look at the world, it can be divided into three. Aham, I. Self, Jiva, a 
what do I confront? Anything I confront is called the Jagat. Starting with my own body, my mind, my senses. That is also the Jagat. Why is it called the Jagat? Because it is made up of five elements. One reason. Second, it is here today, gone tomorrow. That's why it's called Jagat. The Ja in the Jagat is for Jayate, is born. The Ga in the Jagat is for Gachati, is gone. That which is constantly born and gone and gone and born is what? Jagat. And that has to include my body. Body here today, sometimes gone today. <laughs> gone. Body, body here, body gone, mind, it's sometimes gone before the body. <laughs> it's even gone in the Vedanta class. <laughs> Suddenly I start thinking of something else. I'm unable to focus. Or it's gone because I have attained Nirvikalpa Samadhi in the class itself. <laughs> So, this is the, so the mind is gone, we see the mind going, we see the mind coming back, body is gone. So, everything that I confront is, is what? Born, gone, born, gone, born, gone. Jagat, Jagat, Jagat. What about me? I am also born and gone? No, that's a mistake. That I am a mortal is a mistake. The I has nothing to do with mortality. This we will learn. The I is not coming to an end. In other words, it's not finite. Supposing if you go like this, adopt the Swami Vivekananda pose without being Swami Vivekananda <laughs> and say, why should I believe you? <laughs> Who are you to tell me I'm not mortal? I feel I'm mortal. I, I have only one question to ask you. Do you want to be mortal? Who wants to be mortal? Raise your hands. I'm looking. I'm waiting. I'm waiting for any slow responders. Who wants to die? Raise your hands. Nobody will raise. Not only in India, okay? You go to China, ask in Mandarin language. You go to somewhere in, in Alaska, Aspen. You go, you go to South America, you go to Africa. You go to not so great Britain and ask with an English accent. <laughs> so you want to die. What will they say? No. Have they studied Vedanta? No. Have they studied yoga? No. Nothing. These are just uh, people off the road. You can ask. You can just ask people off the road. Do you want to? Do you want to die? Answer will be no. So the desire to be immortal is not a cultivated desire. It is ingrained. In, in me, just like the desire for food, water, shelter, air to breathe. These are all uncultivated desires. These days, of course, we are very confused. What is a cultivated desire and what is an uncultivated desire? And one time I was talking to youth in Arsha Vidya in America, sailors work. And I told the 17 years old, 16 to 18 years old, 16, 15 to 18, I think. So I told them, I asked them, give me one example of an uncultivated desire. And a bright boy who was sitting right in front, hand shot up. What is an uncultivated desire? I said, great, give me, you know, his hand shot up. I said, yes, please, tell me. And he said, cable TV. <laughs> <laughs> yes, to him that is ingrained. 
because of lack of thinking there, but generally speaking, uncultivated means it is not something that I have produced. I have produced a need and then I have produced a solution that is not there with regard to these desires which I have just mentioned. What are they? Air to breathe, water to drink, food to eat, shelter, clothing. These are all uncultivated desires. And to this list we can add immortality, uncultivated desires. Happiness. Happiness is equal to immortality. We'll be seeing that. What is the connection? We'll see that. Happiness is an uncultivated desire. Immortality is an uncultivated desire. Shanti, some kind of a contentment and a desire to just be undisturbed, uncultivated desire. Then what else? Freedom, liberation is an uncultivated desire. Liberation from what, you may ask? Liberation from an annoying person in one's life. That, we start from that. We start from that. Liberation from whatever it is that you don't want is an uncultivated desire. Liberation from a sense of mortality, uncultivated desire. This is important to understand because when we look at uncultivated desires, that means they are ingrained. We are hardwired for freedom, happiness, which in Sanskrit is called moksha. We are already hardwired for moksha because you cannot desire something that you do not know. Can you have a desire for something you don't know? Even if you say, I want to go to Mars, I don't know Mars, but you do know that Mars exists. So, therefore, so uncultivated desire means that desire is already there. It is, it is inborn and when we talk of immortality, what is it? What is immortality? It is the desire to be forever and ever and ever. Every jiva has it, not just the human being. That's why when you try to run after an animal to kill it for your lunch, what will it do? It will run away. It's not going to sit there and say, okay, I sacrifice myself, please eat me. It's not going to do that. That's why we eat brinjals, potatoes. Why? Because they don't run away. <laughs> and that's our only way of making sure that we are not infringing upon the rights of other beings who also have the right to be. I have the right to be and I don't want anybody to eat me. Do I? No. Similarly, the other being also has a right to be. Even the mosquito that bites you when? Poor thing. So pregnant lady wanting a blood donation. That's what Pujya Swamiji used to say. It usually lives on sap, tree sap, but then it, when it is carrying eggs, it needs a blood meal. That is when it bites. Where does it bite? It will bite not on a well-lit place. It will bite somewhere here. It will bite the legs. It will not bite right here where you can look at it. Why won't it do that? Hmm? Mm, it's afraid you will give it instant moksha. 
It's very clever. The desire to be is there in everything from the tiniest mosquito to Lord Indra, the king of heaven. If you start doing 98 yajnas, Raja Surya yajnas, he starts getting nervous. Oh my God. Because if you do 100, you can replace him. You can replace him. You can become the next Indra. So therefore, he, you know, even he has the desire to be everything from the minuscule bacteria. That's why what does the bacterium, bacterium singular, correct? Yeah. What does the bacterium know how to do? Reproduce. That's how all it does. It's reproducing. Because it wants to survive. One bacterium, you can just kill it. Then many of them are there. You can't kill them very easily. They become antibiotic resistant. And there are only so many antibiotics and so many generations of, of them and so many combinations of them. And then what? Lord Yama has to come some way, okay, <laughs> for a visit. And sometimes he comes in the form of bacteria, antibiotic resistant bacteria. So, like this, we have a uh, you know, we have the desire to be which is inbuilt in everybody. The desire to be is really the desire to be forever. We have to be very clear about this. The desire to be forever means I know what this forever is. Correct? How can I desire the forever without knowing what it is? Very interesting. That means I know somewhere what the forever looks like. And the forever is forever free of sorrow. That also I know without A, B, C of Vedanta. I know. I know this. Everybody knows this. I know I want the forever. I know the forever is good. I know the forever is, the, is, is what makes me happy. In fact, even though we say, I want ananda, it is actually ananda, happiness, joy. It is actually what I want is ananta, for. That's why in every conversation, somebody tells somebody, my son, my daughter got a job. What will the other parent ask? Is it permanent? <laughs> And even in the sixth marriage vows, this time it is forever. Each one thinks. It's her third marriage and it's his or her <coughs> fifth marriage, whatever it is. And then what? This time it is forever. So it's not the marriage one wants. What does one want? Forever. Don't tell your spouse that yet. <laughs> so... It is the forever that one wants, not really the marriage. Similarly, it's not money that one wants. What does money depict? Money means, ha, I am secure. Are you secure? No, actually you are not secure. But you think you are secure because you look at money and say, give it the power to make you secure. Money cannot make you secure, but you think it makes you secure because of that connection, the collective delusion here. Here there is a collective adhyasa, a collective mistake. If I have this much money in the bank, I am okay. Actually, even after that much money, one is not okay. And money is a funny thing because it has to be protected from itself. <laughs> oh, the inflation. You have to keep protecting it from itself. It's a very funny thing. And so because if you had so many lakhs of rupees 10 years ago, it's nothing now. So it has to keep on, you have to keep on protecting it from itself. And so therefore, when I imbue money with the power to protect me, with the power to make me feel forever secure, Forever, okay, forever. It falls short. 
it is disappointing. And even if the money doesn't change value, let's say one is a very good investor and one has invested extremely well and the money hasn't changed that much value, still is one secure? No. Because if one was already secure, if one was already in touch with that forever, then there would be no reason to, to do anything, to go anywhere. So Panchadashi in the seventh chapter says, the opening verse says something beautiful, it is a quote from the Brihadaranika Upanishad. And it says, Atmanam Ched Vijaniya. If one knows oneself, Atmanam Ched Vijaniya. I am a Smiti Purushaha. If one knows oneself as this forever, this secure, this free, this whole, this is me, this immortal one is me. Then, Atmanam Ched Vijani, I am a Smiti Purushaha. Kimartham, for what purpose? Kasya kamaya to fulfill what desire? Shariram anusanjvare. Will a person get into the realm of feverish activity? It's very beautiful. This, this little mantra from the Vrihadaranyaka Upanishad, if one knows the Atma as this forever, Atma means I. If one knows my, if I know myself as this forever, why will I keep on striving to become something or the other? Very beautiful. And unfolding this small mantra, the, the person in this text called the Panchadashi writes 297 verses unfolding this one mantra. You can, from that you can decide how important it must be. Amazing. Really, really amazing. Seventh chapter of Panchadashi. So therefore, this, uh, this is something we have to look at. Let us go back now to the rope snake example. Why do I mistake the rope for the snake? Why? Illusion. illusion? Why, why, why suddenly you had illusion? Not, not enough light. Ah, not enough light. Correct. Lack of knowledge, not enough light. And I see something. That's why the example always takes place in twilight. I see something. It is known. But not fully known. On a fully known rope, can you see a snake? No. Even if the rope is frayed to look like a, like a tongue of the snake, if the rope is frayed, still you will not be frayed at all after looking at the rope as rope. Bright daylight, you see the rope? Ah, rope. On a known snake, there cannot be a dhyasa. <laughs> Can you make a mistake on a known snake? No. Let's say it's pitch dark. Not the, you know, no sunlight. Natadbhasayate surya. Then no moonlight. Na shashanka. And then no firebrand, no mobile light, nothing. Na bhavaka. Nothing is there. It's pitch dark. Amavasya. Amavasya, night, pitch dark, no other source of light is there. No, let's say you're in a, a nature area, there is no city lights are also not there. There is a rope lying around. You have to take my word for it. Let's say there is a rope lying around. Will you mistake this rope for a snake? You cannot see it at all. Yes, you cannot see it at all. How will you mistake? Huh? Your mistake? No. So, you can't mistake. Because 
you neither see rope nor you see snake. Only if you see, you know, yeah, not movement. If, you, if rope cannot move, it's not moving. It's pitch dark, you have to take my word for it. Let's say there is a rope. Suppose there is a rope. Can you mistake that rope for unseen rope? Can it be mistaken for a snake? No. Can you mistake the seen or the known rope for the snake? No. Then where is the mistake happening? A somewhat known rope is mistaken for the snake. A somewhat known rope. A fully known rope you cannot mistake for a snake because I see it. This is rope. A totally unknown rope you cannot mistake for a snake. Why? Because you don't even know it's there. A partially known rope becomes a sitting duck for being mistook for a snake. You know, in our Anekati Ashram, there was one Brahmachari who had listened to a lot of Vedanta in a long-term course. Snake rope, snake rope, snake rope. <laughs> so his job, his seva job, was to clear the grounds a little bit. And then he said, oh, very interesting, very colorful, pretty rope. And he held it. <laughs> what happened? Snake. It was a snake. <laughs> it was a harmless tree snake. Can go the other way around also. If we have studied too much Vedanta, whatever <laughs> you see is rope. <laughs> so, a partially known rope becomes the sitting duck to be mistaken for snake. In the same way, a partially known eye becomes the locus of mistake upon which I, the not I, is transposed. What do you mean by a partially known I? Are you here? Don't scare me. Yeah. <laughs> Are you here? Yes. yes. First people think, is it a trick question? <laughs> Not a trick question at all. Are you here? Yes. You can't say no. If you say no, it will be like a small child hiding, playing hide and seek with you who hides behind the couch and says, don't look behind the couch. I'm not here. <laughs> Even if you say I'm not here, you're advertising your presence. Are you here? Yes. Yes, I am. Don't ask the next question. Ramana Maharshi's famous question. What is the question? Uh, better to not ask that. Who am I means what? Idiot. <laughs> donkey. Because that's what I was called in childhood. Donkey. Monkey. Stupid. Pooja Swamiji used to tell a joke. He would say, if you go to if you go to a room full of people and then say, call out, Rama. Rama is a common Indian name. Rama Krishna, Rama Chandra, so many names are there which, you know, Sita, Rama, Raja, Rama, so many names are there. Rama. Half the people in the room will look up. Let's say there's a room full of men. You say Rama, half the room will look up. Then you say, hey, Krishna. Again, Krishna is a very common name. <laughs> So many Krishnas are there. And then the other half will look up. Did you call me? Did you call me? They will all say. Then you go again. You leave five minutes gap. Go into the same room again and say, idiot. All of them will look up. <laughs> <laughs> this is the notion that I have bought into. Adhyasa. This is the notion that I have bought into. And then this is the problem, really. The problem is that on this I, which is infinite, 
on this eye that is free of all sorrow on this eye which is forever which is perfect which does not need money which does not need degrees or pedigrees in order to be okay on this eye that is already okay i have projected notions based on erroneous perception we talked about erroneous perception correct erroneous perception why because what i want to be is already in line with what i am what i want to be is in line already with what i am according to who according to the upanishads i want to be immortal upanishad says hello you are immortal i want to be happy your nature is that of happiness itself i want to be whole and not h o l e w h o l e you are already whole i want to be free you are already free <laughs> you don't know my life you can just say you are already free you come and live half a day in my life you will see how many problems there are that's what one will say so if all this is true why is this not known to me it is known to you whenever you go to sleep are you free or not are you asleep now <laughs> then why no answer is coming <laughs> when you go to sleep are you free or not yes. yes what happened to the people you don't like poof god they don't exist what happened to all the things you do not like god they don't exist in sleep what happened to chronic pains and sorrows that was there from a long time what happened to them gone what happened to the chronic body aches and pains gone everything gone 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 now my question is are you also gone no why because you are able to wake up and say i did not even know how nicely i slept i did not know anything you did know one thing what did you know that you did not know anything you were the witness of you did know one thing in sleep there is no sorrow in sleep whether it happens at home or in vedanta class there is no <laughs> there is no sorrow there is no credit card debt there are no anxieties there is no future problems there is there are no fears and when i wake up and stretch my problems also seem to stretch with me <laughs> i have my bed coffee the problem is also strengthening itself drinking its own uh, brew when i go to sleep nothing this is what in sanskritam we call vyabhichara vyabhichara means there is a discrepancy a contradiction the happy i in sleep who is loath to wake up nobody wants to get up from sleep that's why they have nicer and nicer kinds of alarm clocks an extreme alarm clock in america they have one extreme alarm clock for people who just cannot get up it's the loudest alarm clock you can buy and then uh, somebody showed it to me it is uh, encased in some silicone it looks more like a ball than an alarm clock silicone casing i said what's what does it do what's so special about it please bless this you know you have all these occupational hazards please bless this alarm clock okay what is this what what does it do i said it looks like a ball it's not a clock no no it's a clock what does it do i want to wake up for your vedanta classes swamini ji but uh, i am unable to wake up there therefore i have purchased this <laughs> i should tell you i was now i was completely intrigued how is it going to wake you up what does it do well you know it rings it makes a terrible screeching noise terrible noise horrible noise you can't listen to it really when you're awake <laughs> and then not only that because you see we are just used to 
in the sleep. <laughs> what is that called? Snooze. Snooze. That's again an adhyasa because you are the one snoozing. <laughs> Alarm is not snoozing. You want to snooze. <laughs> That's a mistake. So you just grope around and go like this. Here you cannot go because the alarm, as it is screeching, it runs away, falls <laughs> off the, the whatever it is, table, bedside table, rolls into the other room and <laughs> screeches even more. So you are forced to wake up to go to the next room and turn it off. Yeah. So nobody likes to get up. Everybody likes to go to sleep. And in sleep you are not gone because what? You are here to tell me that was the happiest time in your life. <laughs> That's why you can't wait to go to sleep again. Now, my question to you is, is it only in sleep that you have this happiness? We will see tomorrow. Oh. <laughs> oh. <laughs> Om Purnamadav Purnamidam Purnat Purnamudachyate Purnasya Purnamadaya Purnameva Vashishyate Om Shanti 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 Hari Om Shri Guru Pyo Namaha Hari Om If there are any questions, I can take. Good thing. No problem. No questions? No problem. Any any questions online? Okay. No questions. All right. See you all. Same time, same place tomorrow. Om Namah Shivaya. Thank you, Swaminiji. Hari Om. Take care. Hari Om. Thank you, Swaminiji. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Om. Om, om. Nice, you could all join. Get some sleep now, okay? Yeah. <laughs>